Thank you for hanging in there with us tonight. We've put together a small panel of leaders this evening to try and answer a few questions that some of you submitted ahead of time. We're going to focus on questions that have to do with bringing people together in our communities and in our country. While we all agree with what's happening right now in Israel and Gaza is tragic, we want to focus tonight on people coming together here so that we can build bridges of friendship and understanding on our own. I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction on each of our panelists tonight. And um, as I give you an introduction, please feel free to come up on the stage. The first panelist, um, well, is Pastor Fran Lehman. <laughs> um, he is the founding pastor of LifeSpring Church and the founder of the mission organization New Life for Haiti. The second one is my dad, Mohammed Fahim. He's a local community activist who leads the nonprofit Aman, which stands for American Muslims Assisting Neighbors. He's also the host of the radio show Lightning Strike, Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. <laughs> the third person I'd like to invite is my dear friend, Sheikh Omer Hasib. Omer Hasib is an Islamic scholar that graduated from the Al Qarawin University, the oldest university in the world, founded by a Muslim woman. I had the honor of going to Morocco with him a few months ago and a few of our friends to attend this university, learn about Morocco and the culture of love and acts of service that they embody so much. Fourth, I would like to invite Rabbi Jenny Steinberg-Martinez. We all love her. She's the rabbi of the Joliet Jewish Congregation. And fifth, I'd like to invite back Reverend Robin Caldwell. Robin Reverend Robin Caldwell is the senior pastor of St. John's Lutheran Church here in the Joliet Plainfield area. So please welcome them with a round of applause. <laughs> Just for the um, sake of time, I'm going to ask them some questions that were pre-submitted, but I know as some of you walked in, you were handed a card that has um, suggestions you may have for future interfaith events, questions you may have for future interfaith events, or just any comments. So please feel free to fill those out, turn them in to any of the volunteers. There's also a little box outside the door to your left that you can hand them into, or I'm sure there's um, a way for you to contact Pastor Fran Lehman for any inquiries, or my dad as well. If we have it sometime, maybe we'll take some questions from the audience, but we'll see. So first question I have, I think, okay, there's a mic there. And then if you need, I can pass my mic yeah, down. You guys can pass those mics. Mm -hmm. So someone submitted a question. It says, I am curious if non-white Muslim Americans sometimes feel like outsiders to their communities, like Plainfield, in which they live. And if so, what can the rest of us do to help you feel more like, more like part of the larger community? That's... That's you guys. <laughs> oh no, that's us guys. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Bismillah. Um, thank you, first and foremost, thank everybody to having me and creating this panel and the space. I also want to comment on the lighting because you did a really good job with the lighting. <laughs> and it was, I was like looking at the lighting the whole time. We I just said, redid it last year. I, so, this feels, yeah. I feel alive, to be honest <laughs> with you. I feel like the sacred soul is in me. Um, so uh, the question was, how do you make na do do um, non-white Muslim Americans ever uh -huh. feel like outsiders to the communities they live in, and how can the rest of us help bridge that gap? I guess. Yeah, I mean the the secret, I think. I mean the short answer is a long answer, short answer, but the short answer is like you start to feed one another. You know, one of the first sermons that the Prophet peace be upon him said when he came to Medina, where you had a, obviously you had the Christians of Medina. Uh, in modern day Saudi Arabia and then you had the Jews of Medina and one of the Jewish rabbis heard the prophet peace be upon him give his first sermon where he said spread peace amongst one another he said feed one another um, 
pray in, in, in times when people are, bring people's families together, pray when people are sleeping, and you'll enter the garden in peace. So he gives you sort of the, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You have Muhammad's hi hierarchy of needs, which begins with peace and it ends with peace. So the first one is actually to have like an organic community where it's not necessarily like a college brochure where we're all hitting the diversity quota, <laughs> you know? Where it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Everything's a photo op. So you sort of just have, for, and you, I think one of the beautiful things is actually have real conversations because no matter what we believe in, we're all just trying to get our kid to get off of Fortnite and say grace to the table. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the same conversation and at every level there's a different what? There's a different devil. <laughs> so we're all fighting the same sort of demonic tendencies in like family and community and stress and anxiety and trying to pay the bills. I think we all have a lot of the same expressions and one of the things that God mentions in, in the Quran is that he says that as for the ones that believe and do righteous amongst the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims, and the people of faith, that their reward will be given to them in the end of time. And I think it begins with stop judging one another. Mm. You start creating spaces where people just don't judge one another. That we, we're not, and one of the beautiful things about the humility that comes with people of faith is we're not judge, jury, and executioner. Right? We're not, we have, you have the God of, you have pharaohs inside all of us and Moses inside of all of us. And the idea of Pharaoh is his claimant to becoming God incarnate. And we don't have that sort of tendency. Ours is to attempt to lift people up and to make sure that we create spaces where people feel safe. You know what I mean? So, I mean, did I answer your question? I don't know if I answered the question. No, I think so. I think it right. is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, whoever's question that was. Next question is, even though Christians, Jews, Muslims, and others hold to differing beliefs, how can we build on, our, on what our faiths have in common with one another? I've been handed the mic. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think education is the most important thing. I think we need to learn. Um, uh, may you never know what it's like to be the only one of you in a room. Mm. I spent most of my life living like that. My family immigrated um, from Boston. <laughs> to the south, to the south of the United States, to the south. Uh, that le that le is like going from it one is, country is. to another. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. It is. It is. And I was one of very few uh, Jews in the town. Um, and you know, so we need to learn. You know, I remember riding the bus, and I killed. You know, I just I wear your horns. Everything. You know, everything. Um, but it's important for education purposes for people to understand, you know, understand that Judaism is, you know, 5,784 years old, uh, more in line with my Hindu brother Pete, who's 6,000. They've got us beat <laughs> on the planet. And that the tenets of most religions, we can find them in Judaism. Um, we have mentioned um, the pillars of, of Islam. Uh, and the pillars of Judaism are the same, you know, tzedakah, tefillah, prayer, every day, not so many times, but <laughs> uh, constant state of prayer. Um, and then tikkun olam, and then of course teshuva, which is traveling to Mecca or Yerushalayim. And it's the same. It's all the same. But you won't know if you don't ask questions. You won't know if you don't talk to each other. Um, and it is important as the world gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you know, uh, that we talk to each other and educate. So I think that is, for me, the most important thing is that people feel comfortable to just ask as many questions as possible. Um, and whatever faith you have, it is very personal to each individual. Your connection to your creator is very sacred. And it is the worst thing that you can do, actually, I've been told that it is the only sin you can do is to interfere with the spirituality of another human being, you know? And so we have to um, respect each other's connection because there's no way, I always say, there's no way God would appear in the sands of the desert the same way, definitely not the same food, as he would appear in the beautiful, colorful India. Of course it would have a million shades of color. Of course, because the world speaks to us with the things around us. God speaks to us with the world around us. And um, so education and questions would be my answer. 
Um, I, uh, I, I go back to and try to um, teach where the roots of our faith began, and it's a sh they're shared roots um, back in stories of uh, creation, where God made all of creation, made, made all human beings, and made everything in and on the earth, and then far up in the heavens, and um, made it good. So if we were all made good, then we are all beloved by God, and that's a good place to start. Um, and Abraham is another... Um, person of, the, of our shared faith that I feel like um, we go back um, often in the, in the fall is when we start our what we call a lectionary, our pattern of uh, scripture that we preach and teach in worship. And so going back to Abraham, we remember the promise that God gave the world, that um, Abraham was blessed to be a blessing, that um, God promised that Abraham would be um, an ancestor to descendants that number like the stars in the sky, that number like the sands of the sea. And um, that, did I say he would be blessed to be a blessing to all families of the earth? So all families, to me, that's, that's that is, and the story that, you know, if those, ca if these stories came from all of us, that's where we, be, that's our beginnings of um, our religious practice and our, and our faith life, then that's just the core, and that's, that's, uh, that's what I return back to, to to remind myself and remind others that we are all one people and we all belong to God. Yeah, Robin, you, just, you took us back to creation there, and it's interesting to me that all our faith, certainly there are differences between our faiths, and that's why we practice the faith that we do, because we, you know, we believe the things that we do, but, but all our faiths teach that the human being is sacred and made in the image of God. And it's so interesting that then, as people of faith, somehow in our particulars of our faith, we, we sacrifice that on some unholy altar, and we, and we uh, begin to regard people who are different from us as not sacredly human. Um, and we do it in the name of the faith that tells us that every human being is made in the image of God. And there's a, there's a funny twist there that we religious people need to give up. Mm. So, Thank you. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I really, again, a show of hands, how many of you have read the Quran? Okay, except for the, the Muslims <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> You're excluded. But uh, in the Quran, there is a constant mention that as a Muslim, I have to believe in the revelations of God throughout the ages brought by different prophets, from Abraham to Moses to Jesus. 24 plus prophets, I believe, are mentioned in the Quran by name. But then a couple of weeks back in Naperville, there was a, a book released by a good friend of mine, Dr. Anil Joshi. And uh, he's a Harvard professor, he's written a book, and Somebody came up to me in that group. I was the only Muslim, by the way, in about like 50 people, I would say, Pete, that day. So one of the gentlemen came up to me and said, you know, you guys have all uh, the Abrahamic faith is different from the Eastern mystic religions. Mm. I'm like, okay, man, why do you say that? <laughs> Fundamentally, in, in the Quran, there is also mentioned that God sent a messenger to everybody in creation. Some of them are mentioned by name in the Quran, many of them are not. In fact, I think there's a number, is what, 124,000 is what the number is mentioned. Prophets were sent throughout the ages. So, if you look at that and then you get to know, and we started talking to each other, that's why I said each one teach one. By the end of our conversation, he was like, yeah, I never thought of that. You know, I kept thinking that the Abrahamic religions are different from, I said, no, nope, we're all the same. One creator made us. But then I was at the Will County board meeting. Uh, we were d debating whether Juhi should get funding or not for her mental health board. She is on the mental health board of Will County. And uh, 
this lady that I had known for like six, seven years comes up to me and says, good morning, Dr. Patel. <laughs> and I'm like, um, you know, my name is Mohammed. So I realized one thing, that I have not done a good job of introducing myself to my fellow neighbors in Will County. Because for you guys, every brown guy is Dr. Patel. <laughs> okay. So I need to work on that. Uh, I have else to say. I, the only thing I would say is, you know, focus on the timeless universals and not the passing incidentals. Amen. You know, focus on the timeless universals. We have timeless universals, like, um, like our pastor mentioned. You know, we're all created. We all believe the two. The only two things that we believe are guarantees in this earth is that we're from God and we're going to return to God. Everything else is up for negotiation. You know, I mean, everything is up for negotiations. And one of the really beautiful things about being part of the fabric of America is we're all, we're, America is a work in progress. You know, America is a work in progress. And we know we're a work in progress. <laughs> we're very aware of it. You know what I mean? Um, and we're a growing community. But one of the beautiful things, I think, you know, if you go to D.C., there's Thomas Jefferson's Quran. Thomas Jefferson had his own. He had a Bible. He had a, he had a Torah. He had a Quran. He also had a Bhagavad Gita. He actually had all of them. One of the things that they mentioned in, 19, in 1786 in Virginia, they had, the, uh, they had the Religious Freedom Act that was written. And John Adams presented it. And he said that America is ordained to be a country where anybody can, uh, the practice of religion should be done freely from the, the Jew, the Gentile, the Christian, the Mohammedan, the Hindu, and the atheist. You know? It, it, those, were, those were things that this, we, we were founded on. Now, whether if, if we've lived up to those is one conversation, yeah. but we believe those values to be timeless universals. And as God, as the devil tries to, you know, uh, as they say, the devil's in the details, we say the devil divides you in the details, but God unites you with the essence, you know. So, yeah. It's... Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to ask one more question so that we can wrap up, give everyone some time to mingle and talk amongst each other and have some refreshments that have been provided. Can you address the apprehensions we all probably sometimes have in actually building personal relationships with those who are ethnically, racially, or religiously different from ourselves? Um, I would just say it's... Um, it's a practice, um, and it's something that um, it's easier for some people than others, I think. Um, and um, to enter into conversations or introductions with humility mm. and respect, yeah. and um, we have two ears and one mouth, <laughs> <laughs> um, to keep that in mind, too. But. Um, yeah, I think it, I think you, if you're a praying person, you know, to prayerfully enter into um, um, whatever opportunity God might have before you, and consider, you know, if you're in line at the grocery store, if you're waiting for your kids at the playground, or um, if there's a neighbor that you haven't had the chance to introduce yourself to, um, to just kind of consider that a nudging from God that maybe that's that's the person that um, you're to meet that day. Um, so just start small. Just take one step at a time with people that you already are in the same spaces with. I, I think it's, you know, the big challenges, I think, for the first, you know, deal, I think all the faith traditions deal with the emergence of the nuclear families because we used to be more neighbors before. You know, there was a time where you it didn't, you know, when you were a kid, used to get yelled at by your Christian auntie and your Jewish auntie and your Muslim auntie, you know what I mean? Like, it was all the same. Uh, there, is a, there, there was communities that were, had, you know, these neighborly tendencies, and I think it's really tough for us as we become more isolationist and as more separate from another, you know, that we don't have these. One of the things that, you know, there was, a, there, there was one of the, the disciples of the prophet or the companions of the prophet said that the first thing, if we believe God would punish us, the first thing he would remove from us is intimacy with one another, that we wouldn't have communities anymore, right? I mean, a community is how sort of we, 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 we thrive and we, we learn to love one another. Um, and there's a really deep, and look, at, we are committed to our faiths. Like, this is not like some sort of like, we need to be, 
a little decommitted to faith. I think that's, that's, a, that's, that's the same battle we're all trying to fight, is how do we recommit to faith? Um, but there's, Dr. King mentions that, you know, there's a difference between unity and uniformity, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know the story of the teacher with his 15 disciples, and he says that, how many of them are you? And he says, 15 of us. He says, well, tell me when you all become one, right? I mean, the day will really come when, when it, God forbid, it never happens again, but if somebody goes through some tension in our family, we don't see it as a Muslim child or a Jewish child or a Christian child. We see it as one of our children, or no, that's one of our children. That's our community's children, right? Um, and that's, once we get to that level of actually having empathy for one another and recognizing that, you know, we, we're, we're all going to, if, if we don't live together, then we all just die alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think we have to get our hearts to that place, you know, and, and uh, start visiting your grandparents. <laughs> and start visiting your grandparents, you know, you know. So, that, yeah. No, I, I do think it's true that as Americans in, in kind of the modern world, we are more isolationist, right? We have, our, we have our, maybe our little group of friends, we have a big color TV and we have Netflix and, you know, we come home from work and we do our thing and, and uh, so there is less community in general, right? There's less front porches and people mingling in the neighborhood and all that kind of thing. Um, and I think it's okay to admit that um, it, it takes courage. We are, we, we do tend to, as human beings, to be more comfortable and kind of stick with the people that look like us or that we think think like us or, you know, live the way we do, same, same practices, same worship, whatever. Um, and it, it does sometimes take courage. There's a moment where you might have uh, someone who moves into your neighborhood and it might, you might say to yourself, maybe I should go over and knock on their door and introduce myself and meet them. But then you also might say, oh, I don't know. You know, they look different from me or, you know, uh, what, whatever it is, you know, um, and I know for me personally, oftentimes, uh, you know, I've been down to the country of Haiti a uh, hundred times or more, and when I first started going there, the language was different, the people looked different, everything was different, and I found that it took courage to build relationships with people, and I think it's okay for us to say it takes courage, and, and then courage isn't, they say courage is not the absence of fear, you know, um, courage is, is even in the midst of fear to choose to do something. And um, I would just encourage you to be courageous. You know, you know one of the things that I, I have noticed is that um, fear makes us jump from the neck up, right? We live from the neck up, most of us. The phone, the computer, the television, we don't have to go into our hearts. Mm-hmm. We don't have to live from the neck down. And we forget, you know, we forget because um, it's scary to be vulnerable. It's scary to risk to be hurt. Um, it's, it's, and so we just jump right up. And young people today aren't even in there yet. That's my theory. We got to put them there, right? We have to sing with them and dance with them and, and, and get them in their body, get them feeling their heart, you know? The first letter of the Torah is a bet, and the last letter is a lamed. And you put them together and you get the word lev for the heart. It's the code of the heart. 300,000 letters, you know? It's just a code. And it teaches us, you know, we all know, v'yahavta l'oreacha kamocha, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. But it's not good enough now, you know? Those things that we've been saying over and over to each other, they're not working. They're not penetrating from the neck down. And there's another saying that I've been thinking over and over since everything that's happened, you know? Um, and it's my, what I think is the most important sentence in Torah, you know, this week, is kiachai lo amut, which is say yes to life and no to death. We are united in life. Life is a gift. It's a blessing. Everything about it. And I love that what was shared by everyone, to look upon another and not see the heartbeat inside them is from the neck up. Mm. We have to slow down enough to, to hear the heartbeats, not only of the Mother Earth, because 
she's shaking us off anyway, but of each other. But we do, we, I think slowing down for me helps. Like singing like I did, I was terrified. I'm still terrified by the way. But I do it anyways, and singing and dancing and laughing and being in the body, you know, being with each other and risking being a human, right? It's just a wonderful gift, so um, I, I just want, feel so I grateful. Just, I want to just say, let's hear it for being terrified and living anyway. <laughs> All right, right. You, know? you shake it out. <laughs> I think we're, we are coming up to the, to the end of this uh, gathering. One of the things that I wanted to really have as a, you know, as a going forward thing, if we can form a group, a core group of eight to 10 people, if you would like to be a part of that group, Pastor Lemon and I have been talking about that, that we can come together and we can plan other activities for us to come together. So it's not my idea or his idea, yeah. but uh, you know, we all have some wonderful people in here. If you'd like to be a part of the core group, please let uh, Pastor Lemon know, let me know. Uh, there's a card out there, maybe you can put your name on there, say we'd love to be a part of this a core group, and let's plan some things for the, for the next year that is coming up. Yeah. Uh, on that note also, I really, really want to thank everybody, Thanksgiving is coming, and uh, especially uh, our police and our firemen. <laughs> Please give them a big hand. And, <laughs> Chief Miller is, uh, is here. Uh, I, I host a Sunday morning talk radio show on WCPT called The Lightning Strike. That's an 8.20 a.m. And uh, people call in and they have questions of all kinds. And uh, when I don't have an answer, I don't make it up. I tell them that let me find out and get back to you. Hmm. So let us get into that habit. If we don't know something, it's okay. find somebody and it's okay. Okay, I've got 50,000 people listening on Sunday morning. I can make up anything that I want and they will believe me. <laughs> but I'm not going to go back home and sleep easy that night. So if you don't know something, please ask somebody. And ask somebody, and if they don't know something, it's okay. You can ask someone else also. So if you want to be a part of the core group, please get involved and let us see what change we can bring from the grassroots through playing field. Okay, I think you pretty much wrapped it up, but um, I'd like to thank again our panelists for being here tonight to take out the time from your busy evenings to answer some questions submitted by those in our community. I'd like to thank the community for coming out, right? Like, give yourselves an applause. So much is going on these days. I know a lot of people are feeling overwhelmed, stressed, just processing day-to-day -day things that are happening in this world and in their own. So it does take time and effort to be here. So we really appreciate that you all showed up, that we're all here for one another, and that this can be the start to many more events going forward. I want to just share that outside, they have set up some refreshments, some snacks, some desserts, coffee, tea. So we hope that you'd like to stay for a little bit, mingle, enjoy some snacks. Um, like Sheikh Omar said, food is a great way to start a conversation. And we've heard a lot about coffee tonight. Um, so please take part in that. Thank you again to Life Spring Church for having all of us here. And thank you to all for being here. Have a good evening, and thank you for putting up with me. All right. Thank you, Judy. Now, please stay, have some refreshments, and uh, maybe introduce yourself. Good way to start. Introduce yourself to someone that you don't know.